Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this computer here. It's a Samsung S5200 laptop. And laptop is a term we could apply very loosely to this thing because it's neither battery powered nor light enough to fit on your lap. This thing is a beast. It weighs an absolute ton and it doesn't work. When you plug this thing into the mains power, it has a built-in power supply. It doesn't show any signs of life whatsoever. It doesn't even attempt to turn on. So in this video, I'm gonna to try to revive the power supply that's in this thing to see if we can get it to turn on and post, because then maybe we can figure out what type of display this has in here, because I have a hunch that this might be some type of gas plasma discharge display, which in the late 80s was something that you did find on PCs, and it looks frankly amazing. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Well, let's take a look at this laptop. <laughs> you know, that term is can only be loosely applied to this thing because this thing is so big and heavy. But if we have to think about the time period when this came out, which my assumption is uh, this is a 286 machine. So at the time, other machines that were portable 286s were luggables as in like the compact portable, which had a CRT and full-size disk drives. And then after that, you had lunchbox computers, which were essentially all of these same parts that are in this thing reassembled into a different form factor where it had a flip down keyboard and disk drives were on the side. I actually think that particular form factor was probably a little more portable than this particular computer. Anyhow, let's start on the top side here. We have a big slab of gray plastic with some stylistic lines in here, the Samsung logo. Looking at the front of the computer, this is what you would be looking at if you were about to go use this thing. There are little levers on each side here that when you flip them, it allows you to open up the screen. We'll do, we'll, we'll look at that more in a second. So nothing really on the front panel here. Feels like there's a screw hole right here. So we'll obviously have to bust into that a little bit. If we look at the left side here, we have the aforementioned latch for the top lid. There's an internal and external switch here. My assumption is, um, well, maybe it has to do with the keyboard. That must be a keyboard jack there. So internal or external keyboard. Perhaps it's also the screen as well. So we'll figure that out if we can get this thing to actually turn on. There is a cooling fan and then we have two ISA slots. And if we tilt this thing up, you see that there are two slot covers. So I assume we have full size 16 bit ISA slots inside this computer. Turning it around to the back side, we have an AC mains input with a power switch and a voltage switch and a fan. Over here on the ports, we have a nine pin video connector, dip switches, parallel port, and a serial port. We do have a couple screws right here that maybe remove this cover here, which might give us access to these ISA slots. Let's just pop that off. And inside we see we have two ISA slots, an 8-bit slot and a 16-bit slot. And the 16-bit appears to be full length because it actually can uh, extend over into this area above these ports. Okay, well, that was a little interlude. Let's keep going on to this side. So we have a floppy drive and uh, well, that's really it for this side of the case. All right, so let's crack this thing open. Take a look at the beauty of the inside. So there it is, the Samsung S5200. We have a pretty full size keyboard there that feels rather nice to type on. Definitely a little bit of yellowing on the space bar there. It doesn't have a separate arrow key or T arrangement. You do have to use the up, down, left, right on the numeric keypad. So that is a bit like an XT. This I think is a 286. Well, it must be a 286. It has a 16 bit ISA slot in there but yet it only has 10 F keys. It has an escape key over here, which is a little of an unusual arrangement. Samsung decided on an extremely long space bar. And because of that, they put the control key up there where the caps lock is and caps lock is over here. So it doesn't have the normal control alt on either side of the space bar, which I don't know, kind of sucks. 
Looking at the screen, <laughs> we have a huge bezel. In this day and age, we have laptops with absolutely minuscule bezels. In fact, what is it? The latest Macintosh has a notch for the camera on a laptop, which just seems absolutely ridiculous to me, but um, whatever. This thing obviously has no notches because it has a simply massive bezel. I'm noticing that we have one broken clip and it is plastic, unfortunately, and it is snapped off. And I have to say, when I move this computer around, I can kind of hear something floating around on the inside. It's probably that clip. This clip luckily is still attached, which means this lid does stay closed. Looking at the bottom of the screen, we have a brightness slider, a contrast slider. We also have HDD run. There's a speed indicator, scroll lock, num lock, caps lock, and a power indicator. And while you might think this is a button, it's not actually a button. And if we turn this heavy beast of a computer over, I can't believe the weight of this thing. It's absolutely outrageous. On the bottom of the machine, we have four rubber feet, which are intact, a whole series of screws, which we're probably gonna have to take off so we can open this thing up. And we have the Samsung label. Looking at said label, nothing particularly interesting. Made in Republic of Korea. Model number S5200 again. And then we have a serial number of P03988. Now, when I was first given this machine, I took one look at it and I saw that it looks very similar to the early Toshiba portable computers that have this same form factor. And those Toshiba units are almost always gas plasma screens. They have a beautiful orange gas plasma display. I really hope that this particular computer was also gas plasma. But the funny thing is, when I looked up this particular model number, I really couldn't find any information on the S5200 whatsoever. If you type in Samsung S5200 into Google, you find a whole lot of information about some phone that they made called the S5200. But if you add in the word computer, you do get slightly different results. You can see I've looked at a couple of those things here. So one of them is an eBay listing. And of course, eBay listings are transitory. So this one has since popped up and um, it's pretty hilarious. Very collectible and rare. Really collectible? Who exactly is trying to collect the Samsung S5200? I don't really think anyone is. Rare? Yeah, it's definitely rare. Collectible and valuable, like worth $529? I doubt that. Even worse for this particular seller, it says for parts are not working. Yeah, of course it's not working. It's probably not working for the same reason that this computer is not working. Anyhow, the machine's not working, so there are no pictures of it turned on. Plus, there's really no information about the machine. And if we take a look at the description here, I had this laptop for 30 years. It was hidden away in my mother's room. Found it and decided to sell it. It's very rare and hard to find. Hopefully, someone can get it going again. In excellent condition body-wise, except a minor crack on the hinge, we open the laptop. Very heavy and one of the first on the market. <laughs> Oh, that's just hilarious. It's like written by someone who doesn't really know much about computers. <laughs> so they just, they just put that stuff there. Other than the fact that this computer has a couple ISA cards installed in it, it doesn't tell us what I really want to know. Is this thing one of those terrible early LCDs or is it the gas plasma display? And the reason why I'm actually asking this question is because if this is just another machine with a terrible LCD screen, which is barely readable if this thing is working, then is it even worth my time to try to fix this computer? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'd probably just give this machine away before even attempting to fix it, if that's the case. Now, if we go back to the search results, looks like there's... This, is this another listing? No, oh, this is the same one. But actually, if we scroll down, vintage laptop with 286 processor, a much more reasonable price of $128. And there it is. Look at that glorious, glorious screen there. Now, it's in really bad shape with the lines and I have no idea if that kind of thing is fixable but that is that beautiful gas plasma screen. Now, <laughs> I mean, I say beautiful because I think it's just rare and unusual. Take a look at the horrible contrast ratio. Like the dark part of the screen is like a darker orange versus a lighter orange. I don't think that's worse in the photographs than in real life. I mean, obviously um, this line that's running diagonally is an artifact of the refresh. These vertical lines, on the other hand, are the panel failing and there may not be any way to fix it. But we can tell for sure that this is not just some run-of-the-mill LCD, that it is a gas plasma, and I think that means I need to try to fix this computer. 
Let's see if there's any other pictures that will reveal any useful information about this other machine. Not really, other than uh, it says EGA there, and I don't remember. Actually, the little panel on the back of this one also said EGA. I didn't even notice it while I was looking at the back there. So cool, it has a built-in EGA display. And there it is playing a game. And that kind of tells us that not 100% of these are broken. So that means there's a chance that maybe this thing can work again. And check this out. There's actually a massive carrying case that matches the computer, which is nice because the Toshiba versions of this computer actually have a built-in carry handle because the computer is so heavy. And this thing has nothing like that. It has nowhere to attach a carry strap and it has no carry handle. So <laughs> you kind of need this bag. And it was almost certainly included with the, the unit and it has a Samsung logo on it. So kind of tells us that that was the case. And scrolling down further, oh, we're back to those phones. And uh, oh, here, here's a post on VCF about this. I think this is what, oh, I read this one. This is what I read when I first got this computer. It talked about the fact that it has built-in SCSI and a 286 processor, has SIMs for memory, one megabyte each, so four megabytes. But this user was only able to get it to recognize four megabytes. There's a photograph of the inside. Now, the funny thing is, is I had read this, like I mentioned, but it doesn't mention anything about the screen. So it didn't give me the clues that I was looking for as for if this was a plasma or not. But now we've seen with those Google search results that we know for sure that this thing has a gas plasma, which means I'm gonna keep trying to repair this thing. All right, well, does this even fit into view of the top camera? No, it doesn't really. I'm gonna grab something to contain the screws. I'm gonna use this little cup here and we're just gonna start disassembling this thing. That's not the right screwdriver. I think the one I was using is what I'm gonna start with. I'm just gonna start taking out every screw I can find and hopefully the cover comes off relatively easily and we'll see what we find on the inside. I assume we're gonna have leaky caps on the power supply. I took all the screws out on the bottom and I have this little sheet here because the three that are along the bottom edge where the keyboard is are these longer ones. Then there are two medium length ones around here on the bottom of the case. And then everything else are these same length screws. Now with all of those out, the top cover, including the screen, does appear to be loose at this point. I'm gonna try to figure out how to lever this off. off. I do not wanna break anything, obviously, since this machine is in such good shape, other than that uh, broken clip on the top cover. So let's see how this all comes apart. And there we have it. The lid has been removed. The key point is you take all the screws off the bottom and there is one screw on the back here that goes into there around the fan area. You gotta make sure you take that one off and that's sort of on the top cover. There are a few things that go to the top cover that you have to disconnect it for the screen. These two connectors right here. And then there is a multi-pin connector right there that you have to disconnect as well. That's probably the power that goes to the screen module. So taking a look on the inside, we can definitely confirm we have a SCSI hard drive right here. Looks like we have a Seagate ST138N hard drive. N on these early Seagate drives always designates that it is a, a SCSI drive. Now I don't need to do too much testing here to know that the power supply is the problem on this. I like how it's in this large, very heavy self-contained unit here. So let's get this thing off and opened up so we can start to investigate what exactly is going wrong here. Looks like we have four screws to take off, two on each side. I'll be using this little magnet sheet here because it allows me to keep track of sort of roughly where visually the screws go. I'm going to keep it uh, as if this is the front of the computer over here and that is the back. Okay, four screws out. Let's see, there's some shielding here. All right, we can flip this over and get a little glimpse of the inside of the computer here. So we have a Paradise chipset here. This is obviously the EGA card. Okay, so looking here, it looks like um, I'm just gonna have to disconnect these cables here from the various peripherals. And there is a connector here for the motherboard. So we get that off. And this is the fan connector for the side of the fan. So we'll get that off. And you probably can get an idea why this thing is so heavy because you saw all the components that were in there and they were pretty much the same as like a desktop computer. Although, you know, three and a half inch floppy drive and three and a half inch hard drive versus the five and a quarter inch versions. But yeah, we're all talking about pretty standard and extremely heavy stuff. All right, so looks like there are screws on the bottom. I think this is just some kind of a metal RF shield that is simply glued down. So let's just 
try to peel this up here. Since I don't feel like getting cut by the sharp metal, I'm just gonna put on some gloves. All right, so that came off and it was a little destructive, but I'm not too concerned. I probably will not be reattaching that. Okay, so as I suspected, power supply screws are accessible once you peel that off. Ah, turning this on its back, I didn't notice this. We have a label showing the different voltage rails here. Take a look at that, 205 volts, and that is for the gas plasma screen. The rest of these are all pretty run of the mill. Unfortunately though, that is not. If this was only these plus and minus five and 12s, I could just replace this whole thing with one of those Pico ATX type power supplies. It would be really easy to do, but we can't easily get plus 205 volts for the gas plasma. So we're gonna have to try to get this thing working. Okay, so there it is. Let's take a look at what we see. Things look pretty good. First off, there are no refos, so that's good. Uh, does appear we have a blown fuse though. So that unfortunately doesn't bode well for this power supply. We're gonna have to try to figure out why the fuse blew right there. I don't wanna just swap it because almost certainly it will just blow that fuse again. Incidentally, looking at this, you might think, oh, that's bulging, that, that cap has popped up there. But you know what? I've actually found that these types of caps often have that kind of lid on there. I don't know if it was originally like that, but if I poke a hole in that to try to relieve the pressure, it's not like anything's gonna come out of that. It's almost like that plastic is domed like that just from the get-go. Okay, so let's take a look at this thing. There's some glue down there, but these are really good quality caps, very similar to the ones that are in use on Apple II power supplies, and they don't generally leak. So that's not leakage, that's just glue. We have some more caps over here. Everything looks quite okay here. I'm just doing a visual inspection first because we just need to kind of see if anything looks out of the ordinary first. And then we're gonna have to start looking for shorts on the switching transistors and other other components. No, everything looks fine, at least from the visual inspection, other than the fact that this looks blown. I haven't tested that. Let's grab the multimeter. Okay, multimeter's on continuity check there. So we'll hear beeping and let's just check. Yeah, that fuse is open. Now I think what I need to do is figure out how to get this PCB out of here because I need to be able to look at the back side so we can start checking for continuity and things like that. All right, so we have some screws. Uh, that's nice, they design here. This has removable connectors. So there's that one and there's another one there for the power switch. And with those two screws out, I think this thing should come out. There we go. Uh, now it goes without saying, you shouldn't work on power supplies unless you know what you're doing because um, these caps here, these ones here especially, can hold a little bit of a charge. Now I haven't plugged this thing in in forever. It's been months and months and months, so um, there's no there's no danger of that. But to plug this into this stuff, of course, this is mains when it's plugged into the wall, and that can be lethal. So you have to be very careful. First thing I want to do is I'm just going to look to see if we have any obvious broken solder joints or cracks on here. Nope, nothing that I see. So I'm going to start looking for shorted components, diodes and transistors specifically, because it's not likely that caps short that cause problems. It's probably something that's shorted in this area here or some of these diodes here. So that's what I need to start looking for. Now, one of the problems is, is the switching transistors here. This is what drives the switch mode power supply. These are connected directly to the windings of this. So you can often have what looks like a short across these parts when it's not a real short. And the only way to really test those is take them out of the board. Now I'm no expert, in working on these types of um, power supplies. So this may be a futile effort. And if I had access to schematics, that would certainly make my life a lot easier. But unfortunately I do not because we can't even find any information about the fact this laptop exists other than the fact we see listings of it and a post on VCF forums. But anyways, okay, so um, yep, there's lots of diodes to be seen. I'm gonna start over here with the bridge rectifier and kind of look at the high voltage side first, but over on the low voltage side, there's stuff that could cause shorts as well. Although I think most likely 
we're gonna have a problem over in the high voltage side. Everything on the low voltage side, if something were shorted like on the motherboard or something, it would certainly not blow the fuse. It would just cause the power supply to shut down. Uh, there's a regulation circuit here. There's like a feedback winding here that makes its way. Look at this kind of like glued on there. Uh, the reason why this plastic is on here is because, um, where is it? This thing here is very close to that. Okay, so it didn't take long for me to find something that appears shorted. This little blue component here, it says D1. I don't know what kind of diode this is, but on my multimeter, it shows as a dead short both directions. Now, the only way to know for sure is to remove that from the board or lift one leg of it at least. And then um, that'll, that'll tell us. I'm gonna grab a marker here. So we need to start marking things that appeared shorted because then I need to lift one leg. I'll put a little dot on there, lift a leg. And once we lift the leg, we can check it again. Okay, found another one here that looks looks to be shorted. Now it's right next to this little transistor here, or not transistor, transformer. So that could well be a lie. Could just be, you know, something with the transformer. I and mean, who knows, that other diode as well might be, uh, might be hooked up to that transformer. So that's why pulling a leg out is the only way to know for sure that there is or isn't a short. Okay, I'm gonna flip this thing over and I'm gonna check this bridge rectifier because uh, if this is shorted, that definitely, no, that's fine. That can cause uh, the fuse to blow. No, nah, this thing is totally fine. So it is not the bridge rectifier. None of those legs are shorted together. Now we have these packages here on the heat sink. These are the ones that may appear shorted. Yeah, that one does, but that might be just because of the transformer windings. Let's check this one. No, that one doesn't look shorted at all. Well, it does across those two pins. So we're gonna need to take that out. We're gonna have to take that one out. So this is one of the diodes from here to here that appears shorter, but this is a transformer. And notice the transformer goes over to here. And this is one of the diodes that appears shorted as well. So if this diode is shorted, it's going to make this one look shorted as well and vice versa. So I'm gonna start I'm gonna start right here with these two, see what I see when I lift those legs. And while we wait for the desoldering iron to heat up, I'm just gonna check these transistors here. There are four packages there. It was hard to check those from the top side. Let's just see if anything looks out of the ordinary. Mm. That one looks a little weird. This one looks totally fine. It was beeping on that first one, but it wasn't like a dead short. No, that one looks good. And this one here, that looks good. No, that one totally is good. Okay, so this is the one here. That looks a little suspect. So let me just get the marker. Again, we wouldn't know for sure. I don't even know what kind of package that is. That might not be a, a transistor anyways. That could be something like a, not a voltage rate reference or something like that. So uh, taking that out and reading the part number off it is really, the only way to know for sure. All right, we're gonna start with these two diodes here. I just did one side. Let's get a little tool to lift these out. All right, well, I don't think I desoldered one properly, but this one I think came out. There we go, yep. So we can now connect up to this one and uh, that's not showing a short any longer. Let's just flip this around. Wanna make sure that it's a good diode. There it is. That's a good diode. Let's check this other one now. Still shows shorted, but um, let me just get it out of the board completely. There we go, I lifted that up. Let's zoom in a little bit just so you can see better. That is now out of the board. Let's check for shorts. And yes, indeed, it is definitely a dead short. Let's get that out of the board. So, uh, okay, the board is silk screened there. Which way the band goes? Band goes towards this little transformer here. And we're just gonna take a moment to re-solder the parts I removed. All right, so the diode that looks shorted has been removed. It's still hanging in the board there. Uh, this resistor has been re-soldered and this one as well. Let's see if that diode appears shorted. This one that I put back in, nope doesn't appear shorted anymore. It looks like it's working. So uh, that little blue one seems to be our culprit. Let's get this out of here. Should just come out. Hopefully I can identify what kind of diode this is. 
And just to confirm, if we clip onto it, dead short. Okay, so now that that's out, this was the one that seemed like it was acting a little weird. It does say Q6 next to it, which means it does appear that it's just a transistor. And I was getting a strange reading from it. Looks like it's an MPS 2907 from Motorola. So I think that's just uh, a standard part. So let's just double check it again now that the offending diode is out of the board. These two pins show 0 0.0662. Let's get that out of there, Q6. And I'm just making sure that um, it is silkscreen markings to, so we know which way to put it back in. And we do. It fell right out. Let's get a little tester here. See what we get. I guess that's normal, PMP. It's probably whatever was in there around it that was giving us that, that reading. Let's just test it with the, uh, the diode check here. All right, that looks good. And that looks good. So unless it got fixed by heating it up, I'm gonna say that uh, that's a good part. Okay, so I put that part back in the board. This diode that died, the one I took out, if we look here, it is going over to this part. We need to take this one out and this one I think as well. We just gotta take this out because we gotta test this out of the board because if this died, probably would have killed that diode. Uh... Looks like I gotta take out the other part next to it as well because that whole heat sink has to come out. So let's see here, does this come out now? Oh, there we go, very nice. Let's get the multimeter in here and we'll test these parts again <laughs> out of circuit here. Uh, yeah, that is dead. That would explain why the fuse is blown. Totally, totally shorted on all the legs. <laughs> yeah, that's not normal, everyone. That is not how it should work. I'm sure this one is probably okay. So yeah, diode drop, normal. And this one shows open. I don't even know what kind of part that is. Ideally, we should try to get this into the tester here. Let's try here. Hmm. Okay, that looks fine. Let's get this off, because that, I think, is dead. Dead as a doornail. Tester time, here we go. Doesn't really fit. So I'm just gonna kind of hold it in place. This is gonna say resistors. No, okay, when it does that, that's what happens um, when you short the pins together. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a dead part. This is a very dead part. Let's look this up, try to figure out what this is and see if I have one in stock. I have no idea if I will. Probably not, but maybe I can steal one from an old power supply and we can revive this thing. Oh, and then we also gotta figure out what that diode is because it got killed when this thing went short. And I've been trying to find the equivalent part for this PD7491, and I can't even find a data sheet for this. I can't find anything. The only thing I can find is like sketchy sites from China saying that they have this part, which I don't believe it's like a rebadged part. Well, it's some other part number. But this website here says this NTE part does at least 7491, says it can replace this. Of course, uh, it says further down, this is just a wall of text. Uh, acceptable substitute, majority, typical applications, may not be an exact mechanical or electrical equivalent. So that's not reassuring. It means like the pins could be swapped around, things like that. We don't have schematics for this power supply, so I don't know for sure what's the gate and uh, emitter collector, although we could probably figure it out by looking at this board. So I think I'm gonna look around. It says if we scroll back up to the top that this is an NPN high voltage um, transistor. So I need to look around to see what I have that is high voltage and in a similar form factor. It's gonna need to be able to switch like five or 600 volts easily, I think. In fact, let's just see if there's a data sheet for this NTE part here because, uh, oh, 1000 volts blocking and surge area. Yeah, switch mode, converter, yeah. Okay, so it's good for a thousand volts. So I need to find something kind of equivalent. Now, luckily I have some old boards, scrap boards, and those have genuine parts on them because these are like, you know, older power supplies and monitors and things like that. So hopefully I can find a transistor from the switch mode power supplies in those that will suit us for this particular uh, use case. So I found an NPN transistor that's a similar big package, but I just looked it up. It's this one right here. That is not gonna do, not with this 120 volts here. 
So yeah, clearly it says here, this is for like audio amplifiers. This is not gonna work. I need to go to my scrap boards. This was a brand new part. I gotta go to my scrap boards and start looking at what I have on those and pulling stuff off of those. Well, I've been looking high and low in the basement here for a spare part to put in this thing. And I finally think I found something that should be equivalent, hopefully. This right here is the original part that failed along with the diode. Now I was able to read the part off the diode, which using a little loop to actually read the numbers, I'm reading the part number off the screen here on my notes, 1N4742A. This appears to be a one watt, 12 volt Zener diode. And I'm not surprised the Zener failed. It's sort of a typical failure mode of Zeners. When they're overcurrented, they fail short. And they're usually used like in a crowbar type circuit to protect against situations like this where the transistor fails and to prevent major damage from happening to the board before the fuse blows, the Zener goes first and hopefully takes out that two amp fuse on the board. Now, when it comes to the actual NPN transistor, I found this one, which isn't an exact match because this is actually a horizontal output transistor from an old TV board, but I think it should actually work in place of the dead one. After I stopped recording last night, I continued to search for any information that I could possibly find on the shorted part, and I just, I really couldn't. So we're gonna have to rely on the fact that this NTE part hopefully is an equivalent part, and we're gonna look at the specs of this. So things we have to worry about, of course, are the voltage and the continuous and the peak current that this thing can pass. So we're talking about 15 amps and 30 amps. Now for the horizontal output transistor, a lot of times these can't be just used in a power supply like this, but this one doesn't seem to have a damper diode and it actually lists right here, high speed switching power supply output applications. So it actually on the data sheet says that this part is probably going to work. Now, big difference is the breakdown voltage is 1500 volts versus 1000 on the other one, but the continuous current is only eight amps, while on this one, it's 15 amps. So that's a big difference, unfortunately, and it may mean that this part in here will fail due to overcurrent. The same goes for the peak current, which on the horizontal output transistor is listed as pulse, so 16 amps. And on here, it's 30 amps. So the only part that I have that could possibly work in here is going to be about half the current handling capability of the original. Let's just hope that they overspec the original for this, what, 90 watt power supply and that uh, this new part is going to work in its place. There is another thing is that when I get this machine working, if it does work, I'm gonna probably be removing that hard drive and we'll put in something like a blue SCSI or some type of a SCSI emulator. So that's gonna cut out quite a bit of the current draw on the entire unit compared to like the original system, the way it was configured. Unfortunately, we're not totally out of the water yet when it comes to parts that aren't quite right. This is a one watt Zener, the one that failed. And I went into my parts here and the only ones I could find in my parts are these 12 volt Zeners from Bichet here, but they're only 500 milliwatts, which means they have half the current handling capability of the original. So because we're totally bodging up the entire power supply, I think what I'm gonna do is we're gonna install this horizontal output transistor in place of the, the blown one. And then I'm gonna parallel up two of these Zener diodes in here to see if we can get this thing working. Now here's a caveat. I think it's general practice not to parallel up Zener diodes. And that's because these start to conduct at, well, 12 volts for the case of this part, but they're not gonna start to conduct at exactly the same point, which means if one of them starts to conduct early, it's gonna start to carry potentially all of the current, which because these are only 500 milliamps, I don't know if this thing was over spec for the Zener or not, but if it was, then it's just gonna burn up this diode again. And when it burns up, it'll just short, which will, trip the fuse again. Now, if this thing goes up in smoke again, we're no worse off than we are right now. This thing is dead anyways. And unfortunately, if I put an order in for these from say DigiKey, it's gonna take a few days to get to me, especially because uh, we're close to New Year's right now, which is holiday season. So it's gonna be like a week before I can even get to this. So let's see if this stuff works. And if it blows up, then I'll do an order and then we'll have to place with the correct parts. But in the meantime, maybe this thing will work and it will work well enough so we can at least see if the laptop is actually running with a screen that works properly. We don't have all those like streaky lines in the screen like that one listing on eBay. Because if, honestly, if that's the case, there's no way to fix the screen 
and therefore like we're at the end of the road with this laptop anyways. So I'm gonna install these parts and we'll do a jump cut. Uh, there's one quick thing I wanna add. There's a resistor on here that looks like it definitely got really warm. I took it out a circuit just to measure it and it's uh, about 100K. And based on the color code, it's hard to read because it's a little burned. It seems to be a 100K resistor. So it all looks good. I'm just gonna put that back in. But just in case you saw that while I was working on the power supply and wondered if uh, that resistor had gone open. It hasn't. Okay, parts are installed. So heat sinks back on. There's the horizontal output transistor. There's the other one back in the board. That resistor, which is underneath here, is re-soldered. And there are the two diodes in parallel. And this fuse is obviously blown. So let's get this out. And it says three amp at 250 volts. Let's see if this is actually a three amp fuse. 250, three amp. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Okay, so here are some that should fit. This says fast acting, although it looks like there's multiple different types of fuses in here. So let me look at these close up with the, the loop and try to find one that looks like a fast acting fuse. This one here has an F on there. So I assume that's fast and it's only two amp. So we're under spec here, but I'd rather be under spec and blow the fuse out than damage something on the power supply when we power this thing back up again. Okay, so we're ready for some testing. I need to clear all this junk off the bench here so we can safely plug this thing into mains. So let me go do that. The power supply is back in the metal chassis, screwed in as well, so that means it's grounded properly. This is connected to the wall, but the wall has a switch, plus it's off right here. And I have one of the light bulbs connected to the five volt rail. Five volt rail, according to the label right here, is good for seven amps, I think at 115 volts. And it is definitely set to 115 volts on this uh, toggle switch here. When you set this to 115 volts, it actually does a voltage doubling on these two input caps here that are in series. And that presents the same high voltage DC over here to the switch mode part of the power supply as it would if this were set to 220 volts. This is actually a mod I've done on some stuff before, like the uh, Chinese TV to adapt that 220 volt device to run on 120 volts. I've just hardwired in this actual voltage doubling circuit. All right, now we're actually ready for testing. So this one is on the five volt rail. I have it on manual ranging. This one's on the 12 volt rail, also on manual ranging. And I guess we're ready for testing. This thing might shoot fire out of it. So I'm gonna stay well clear of it. As you can see, I have gloves on as well. I'm not gonna be touching it, but just in case, here we go. It's running. 5 volts and 12 volts. <laughs> oh, that was a success. That was a freaking success. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> I just freaking love it. What we need to do is we need to check the 200 volt output here. That is what's used for the, um, the screen. And luckily it is all labeled over here. So we can actually clip right onto that. All right, things have been reconnected. So the blue multimeter here is the 205 volt rail, and this one is five volt, as is picked up off of that connector right there. The screen obviously uses five volts and 205. I'm assuming the five volts is probably just the same as these red wires right here. So we know that works already. Let's just make sure the light bulb is connected. It is, power supply is on. Here we go, let's turn this on. There it is, 210 volts and five volts. So other than the fan sounding really junky, <laughs> this power supply appears to be working, at least right now without any load of the entire laptop on this thing. We just have the one light bulb as the only load. Cool. That was a successful repair, potentially. <laughs> oh boy. All right, so next step is let me try to get this thing hobbled together and connected up to the laptop because I want to see that sweet, sweet plasma screen actually running. I just really want to see if the power supply in its kind of hobbled, derated state here can actually power up the computer as it is, or it's just going to blow, and that's without the screen even connected. My assumption here is that we should at least hear a beep on the computer. There should be a speaker or something in here to show some signs of life, maybe, or the power supply is just going to blow up. Here we go, let's see what happens. Am I recording? Yes, I am, just making sure. Interesting, interesting, interesting. It tried to run, but it actually didn't. Uh, it went into like a shutdown state, which I don't think means it's shorted. I think it's just 
trying to protect itself. I had the power supply connected to the motherboard correctly. Why don't we plug the, the light back in? I just wanna see this thing run like it was a moment ago, or maybe we've already killed the power supply here. Nope, it works fine. Maybe without the drives connected, that's actually not enough current draw, and it's going into a shutdown state, protecting itself. So I'm gonna plug the motherboard back in, and we're gonna leave the light bulb actually connected here. And let's see what happens now. No. Okay. Does that mean we have a shorted tantalum on the motherboard? I bet you we do. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna plug this back in the motherboard, just pull the power cord out here. And with the multimeter on continuity, let's just see what we see here. Uh, yeah, five volt rail is shorted. Yep, totally shorted. How about the green wire here? That's shorted. The yellow wire is shorted. What? How could this be so catastrophic? I wonder if this thing suffered some catastrophic failure. And um, that wire shorted too. What is going on here? Let's just see if this all looks shorted with that disconnected. It does. Whoa. Well, yeah, that's that's not going to work. <laughs> so I repaired the power supply here and uh, the computer is is completely cactus here. So, for instance, on this board here is a couple tantalums right there. Let's just see what we see here. Yeah, let's turn this off and on, make sure the multimeter. So let's see here. Oh, you know what? I think the multimeter was having an issue. You know, I have problems with this thing sometimes. There's something wrong with the range switch, I think, on this. And uh, because now we're seeing 15 ohms, which is completely fine. Okay, so let's put the power supply back on. I just wanna test again on the pins. Unfortunately, yeah, I've been having that issue with this and usually just sort of going back and forth fixes the issue. Maybe I can open it and spray some contact cleaner in here. This multimeter is not that old and it's disappointing that it's already failed. Okay, so five volt rail shows six ohms, but that's actually fine. To this green wire here, there is no continuity, but there it is, 12 volt rail is shorted, 0.33 ohms. That'll be a dead tantalum. And let's check the blue wire here, and that one's fine. So usually what happens is those tantalums, like the ones we see right here, are rated for 16 volts. And that's a bit close to the 12 volt rail, especially when you turn it on, maybe there's like a, you know, goes up to 13 volts or whatever, and then they go short. So we have to find where the shorted tantalum is. That one's not, That these are on five volt rail here. Yeah, five volt rail. I'm tempted to just pull the, the 12 volt wire out of the connector that goes onto the motherboard because ultimately what's shorted here is going to be something for the serial port because that's all it really uses the 12 volts besides the um, hard drive here, which is not connected anyways. And I don't immediately see how to remove everything. Looks like the hard drive takes comes out with these two screws, but the motherboard is not under the hard drive, it's over here on the side. Floppy drive probably comes out with those screws. We definitely have to take this keyboard out somehow, which I think if you take out these parts, the keyboard slides forward and out because there are some tabs along the bottom edge here that would keep it from lifting straight out. Just because I wanna take the easy mode here, we're just gonna take the 12 volt wire out <laughs> and we're gonna run this without it. And let's see if the machine turns on <laughs> just like this. All right, are we ready for testing? Here we go. Power supply is running and I heard a beep. I heard a freaking beep. The computer has signs of life. Yes, let's power that off at the wall. What I wanna do is grab that plasma screen here. <laughs> I wanna see the plasma working. I really wanna see the plasma screen working. All right, as you can see, everything is connected up. I apologize, the furnace just started. I hit the button to turn it off, but it will take a couple minutes to do that. And I'm dying to see this thing test. The only thing I see as a potential issue here, let's move the camera over here, is this wire here that connects from the motherboard to this has some yellow wires on it. I'm wondering if some of those signals are 12 volts. And obviously the 12 volts is missing on the motherboard. So if that does need 12 volt signaling, it is not going to get up to that board. But let's go for broke. I don't think it's gonna cause any damage to have a missing 12 volt rail 
Let's see what happens. Let's see if we get that glorious orange plasma screen. All right, here we go. Oh, it's there and it looks freaking horrible. So unfortunately, this plasma screen has the same problem as the one in the listing. Let's move these sliders here. Oh yeah, that's such a shame. That is such a shame. I mean, there's some positives here. The repair on the power supply worked. <laughs> the computer appears to be working, it's posting. And the plasma works. I mean, it works to the extent that we have that. Now that rolling you see on the camera, that is just a shutter speed thing. Let's see if I can fix that. Okay, yeah, I think the rolling is mostly gone now. So what does this say here? S5200 modular BIOS version three point something or other. Copyright Samsung Electronics Corporation, 1989. Now there's some diagnostics here. Interrupt controllers, okay. Testing CMOS battery failed, of course. 640K found. Checking unexpected interrupts stuck on, yeah, okay. Testing protected mode, okay. Sizing extended memory. Looks like 1,400 and, well, 1,408K found. So this thing has two megs of RAM total. Testing memory in protected mode, yeah, 2,048K, okay. Testing processor exception interrupts, okay. CMOS RAM error, check battery. Keyboard error or no keyboard present, press F1. F1 doesn't do anything. Now we have that switch here, external or internal, right? Let's flip that. There we go, I flipped it, and then I was able to push F1. SCSI Disk BIOS version, Samsung Electronic Corporation, 1988 to 89. It's alive, it's alive. Question is, is this dead pixel row stuff fixable on these plasma screens? Does, does anyone have any idea of how to try to get these plasmas working? Because I don't have the faintest, and I don't even know if this top panel can be taken apart without being destructive. I don't see any screws, so this is obviously clipped together. And obviously one of these clips already broke off here, which means things are probably pretty fragile in there. <laughs> and it's just gonna snap and break. But I guess what do we gotta lose, right? Because the screen doesn't work. And unfortunately, um, these dead rows or columns that is, rows when it's turned on its side, are pretty unsightly. What if I like push on this? No, that doesn't do anything. What about this cable here? No. Now there's something going on inside the panel almost certainly. That is a shame. Well, this video has been some highs and some lows. The high was of course getting that power supply fixed even though I was using scrap parts that I found on old television boards. The low was figuring out that that plasma screen, while it looks glorious, definitely has some big issues. I've been thinking over how I might even open up the screen to take a look at the panel itself and it looks like the sticker that's around the contrast brightness control and the LEDs does peel up and it reveals some screws. So probably the cover will hinge out and allow us to access the panel. Problem is I did some Googling on panel repairs, on plasma panel repairs that is, and it seems like there's really no fix for these types of vertical column issues. There's either problems with the driver ICs that drive the panel or there's bonding problems with the flat flex cable that bonds to the panel, both of which are probably not really repairable. Going back to what I said earlier about what do I have to lose, I think still applies. If I take the panel out and there's no way to fix it, well, then we have a 286 laptop that while working has a dodgy power supply that could fail at any time because I put in substandard parts and then we have a panel that doesn't work. And let's be honest, what makes this particular laptop special is that wonderful plasma screen. And it's really sad to see that it's not working. Anyhow, if you like this video and you thought that me trying to fix this power supply using bodged parts was interesting, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, all the usual YouTube junk, and a huge thanks to my patrons. They make it possible that I do this full time, so massive props to them. If you want to become a patron, there's a link in the description below. Get early access to videos, plus other behind the scene content and stuff like that. I'd love to hear your comments on what you think I should do with this computer, like what the next step should be. So yeah, put a comment down below about that and maybe that's what I'll do in the future. So thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.